Yvonne, are you there? My co-host? Oh, uh, yes, yes, I'm there. Yeah, I know we are in front of many people, but uh, maybe I will do the sharing and I will press the button for all so that we don't have to transition and you okay. can talk in between okay. I, I, and you will tell me next, next, next. I yeah, 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 that's great. Yeah, then, then, uh, okay. Good afternoon, Professor Lu. Yes, good afternoon. Let's see what uh, the this is. The usual is. I'm just switching on my camera. Um, yes. Hi, Yvonne. Yes. Yvonne, are you with us? Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Great. So we are just about to start. As you can see, we have 100. Uh, uh, we already have 100 plus friends with us. Can you see me now, Professor Lo? Yes, 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 I can see. It's difficult to spot. The windows are too small, you know. <laughs> Amar is also there next to you. Yes, uh, yes, and yeah, I can see everybody. No, Mr. Amar, Professor Gapta, yeah? Yeah, great, great. Yes, and you can see me, hear me, everything is okay. Very I well, I can see you. I can see the beautiful bookshelf behind you. Yes, yeah. Great. So, Amar, um, are we all set to go? Yes, sir. Please, please go ahead. Okay. So, very good afternoon to all dear friends who have spared their valuable time joining us back again in our fortnightly event. Uh, today is going to be again a very, very interesting topic and a very interesting discussion with two of, of our uh, global friends, Professor Lawrence Lowe and Miss Yvonne, uh, research associate. Uh, Professor Lowe uh, is a director of Center for Governance and Sustainability at NUS Business School. And uh, Miss Yvonne is a research associate with the same center on governance and sustainability with the NUS Business School. The topic which uh, uh, is going to be in the spotlight for about another 45, uh, 50 odd minutes in terms of the discourse by the two learned uh, professors uh, would be the new sustainability challenge for directors, perils and prospects of greenwashing. And it is because of uh, the research engagements of uh, Professor Lowe and, and Yvonne that we have selected this topic. It's quite uh, 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 near and dear to them and also uh, encompass the research initiatives under the leadership of Professor Lowe and U.S. Business School, one of the finest and reputed business schools in the, in the world, not just Singapore. Uh, 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 the, mm, the discourse is going to be uh, focused on. If I introduce further, uh, professor Lo uh, uh, is a professor of practice in addition to having a uh, director uh, for the Center of Governance and Sustainability. He acts as a professor of practice of strategy and policy and has received his doctorate in management from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. In short, we say MIT. He's a recipient of NUS Business School Teaching Excellence Award. At CGS, Professor Lowe leads the practices on sustainability reporting initiatives covering uh, the complete range of ASEAN countries and Singapore corporations as well. He also steers the Singapore Governance and Transparency Index and the Asia, is ASEAN Corporate Governance Scorecard project so it's uh, it's it's evident that uh, he had been benchmarking uh, companies across the entire ASEAN regions on their performance on corporate governance by focusing multiple parameters i'm sure i'm yet to uh, read that report but yes i i'm hopeful it's uh, uh, full of parameters which must have been focused on professor lo regularly conducts executive programs in governance sustainability and strategy for capacity building of the board of directors. If I briefly introduce you, Ms. Yvonne, she's a research associate and 
has received her MS in Environment and Sustainability from University of California, Los Angeles. At CGS, uh, Ms. Yvonne is working on research related to greenwashing and ESG disclosures using the TCFD framework. It's one of the reputed global frameworks uh, uh, on financial disclosures and, and backed by a complete uh, task force. She is currently working on a report investigating how companies in the ASEAN region do their climate reporting and a study that investigates the relationships between the sustainability of palm oil plantations and credit worthiness. So I look forward for a very insightful and interesting discourse. But before I would also uh, uh, like to uh, 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 like to mention that uh, uh, IICA, specifically the Independent Directors Data Bank, is in, in discussions with Professor Lo and his team on the possibilities as to how we can collaborate to bring more value to the entire group of directors we have. Uh, more than 20,000. So that will uh, not just forge a new relationship, but also open the uh, the vistas of new opportunities of learning, working together on capacity building and research. I can see more than 150 participants have joined Professor Lo, and I invite you and your colleague for the discourse, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just uh, do the sharing of my content. Yeah, we can see to it, sir. Okay, very good. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, very esteemed uh, friends uh, from IICA. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And of course, uh, my being here together with my colleague, uh, Yvonne, and also I have another colleague uh, in the audience as well, uh, Verity, uh, is mainly due to our, uh, you know, uh, in very interesting interaction with Professor Gupta and Mr. Ama. Uh, and we are actually, as the Mr. Chairman has mentioned, uh, you know, uh, hoping to advance our collaboration. And I'm uh, even as I'm speaking now, I'm actually doing it live from Singapore, uh, about 4,150 kilometers away from New Delhi. But, uh, you know, uh, our power is still there uh, through the internet, through this, uh, uh, I'll say, you, you know, uh, online platform for us to share. And today, uh, our topic is uh, basically something that's very close to our uh, research. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Chairman just now mentioned about many things we do at our center, you know, Center for Governance and Sustainability. I think the name speaks for itself. Uh, this is our twin focus. And lately, because of uh, many sensitivities and I would say uh, perspective that's in the corporate space, we will be moving into something called greenwashing. And I think you can see uh, the transparency now is as green as we can get. We, we don't want to make it too green, so we make it a bit of gray because, uh, you know, in greenwashing, literally there are many shades of green. In fact, they are in the gray area. And for the next few minutes, uh, what we hope to do, uh, Yvonne and myself, is to bring uh, this uh, August audience uh, on seven set of ideas. Uh, it'll be a bit dense and fast, but we'll try to paint a very broad landscape uh, globally uh, within ASEAN or Singapore. And also in particular, we, we share some of the perspective from India as well. I believe uh, the audience will be more qualified and more knowledgeable about uh, the setting in India, but nevertheless, we you know we'll share what we have uh, uncovered uh, in the course of our research as well. So these are the seven set of things I will speak on the first two bullet point and the last two bullet point. My learned colleague Yvonne will come in between to talk about some of the details in the consumer, investors, and regulation, and then uh, I will round up with something on the literally the hottest issue, carbon management, climate change, and how greenwashing is being manifested. And then after that, I will pose some challenge and questions, and hopefully we will ignite uh, responses, comments, or even questions from the audience. And of course, if you have a really, really burning question along the way, perhaps Mr. Chairman can even allow certain uh, interjection for that uh, you know, real-time interaction. But let, let me just begin with one of the perhaps 
biggest fiasco or scandal in greenwashing just a few months ago in August last year, uh, DWS, uh, which is uh, you know a subsidiary of the German Deutsche Bank, uh, it is an asset management company. Uh, what happened is that the Wall Street Journal uncovered you know uh, that uh, the chief uh, the group sustainability officer, the uh, a lady by the name of Desiree Fitzler, yes, and uh, she made the claim that uh, among the almost one trillion US dollar of uh, funds at DWS, uh, you know DWS claimed that more than half are actually using ESG, environmental, social, and governance, which is the three facets of sustainability. She claimed that all the you know uh, indication that these are ESG assets are actually false, unjustified. So so you know it, it, uh, it kick off cut such a big fuss among the regulator, both in Germany as well as in the US. Uh, you know the the German regulator Buffin in particular came in very hard. So is the you know the US regulator from multi front and on that day when the Wall Street Journal article came out, stock, stock price of DWS actually tank 13.5% on one day. So you know how serious this is. And even up to now, uh, there's still no resolution. The investigation are still ongoing, but it just showed that even big players, reputable players resort to such things uh, that making false claim. And of course, uh, even before we uh, move on to a definition, which I will say, you know, uh, along the years, you know, uh, many companies, uh, particularly this very interesting environmental company, UK plastic manufacturer, uh, the name is Symphony Environmental, they, they came up with this new thing called the also biodegradable. Biodegradable meaning it can decompose versus just degradable. Degradable means it become microplastic. So biodegradable is a new thing that it can self decompose. So there, there was this uh, many claims along the years and uh, somehow along the way, uh, there's this lab, uh, the West End lab in the US uh, located in Maine, uh, where, you know, near to where I live for more than almost, almost eight years, they actually did a very cheeky test. You know, they put a normal uh, plastic grocery bag versus the so-called also biodegradable. And lo and behold, the ordinary plastic bag from the supermarket decomposed much better than the so-called biodegradable. So, so you can see, you know, despite all the claim, uh, even right here in Singapore, just a few years back, uh, this is a classic story, at least in my hometown here, many years ago when the green thing comes about, uh, they, they wanted a green shopping mall. And what they did was to put you know, uh, to encourage the green habits and green shopping. The first price was a gas guzzling petroleum car, you know, you know, and of course in those days, maybe there's no EV, but at least they, they should have a first price that's consistent with the belief of, you know, uh, having a green planet Earth. But of course, not, not all the green claims are, you know, uh, scandalous or even, uh, uh, say, controversial. Even McDonald came out, but I think it's something a bit more credible. Uh, they painted the arch green actually for some time. Uh, the famous McDonald arch, I'm sure you all have seen it in St. Louis, Missouri, in US. Uh, but having painted it green and making such a big deal out of it, they actually very credibly and in a verified way, they committed to slash their greenhouse gas, reduce carbon footprints in, you know, for specific category. So, so they, they actually go down to the detail, you know, in their, uh, I would say their meat production, uh, their sourcing packaging ways, you know, and uh, they actually uh, wanted to uh, take uh, all, all this reduction in, in two thirds of their company global admission. So, so having said that, you know, it's very prevalent, but what exactly, and uh, you know, it's greenwashing, and I believe many of the audience may be familiar, but just to put everybody on the same page, it is actually a deceit trying to mislead consumers about a certain favorable benefits to the environment, 
and it usually involves a very positive spin about your corporate actions, especially in relating to uh, your involvement uh, by the for the physical environment. So so you know, and it's it's beyond just my you know anecdotes. Uh, studies have found, and th there was a study by the CMA Competition and Markets Authority, uh, in the UK. Uh, they they found that in in five hundred in that international website, uh, you know, th this is global, uh, and they they cover uh many categories such as clothing, cosmetics, food. You know, these are where the normal green claims are found. They found that almost half, forty percent of them were involved in greenwashing. So, so it's very prevalent. You know, I, I actually, you know, go to a lot of events wearing green shirt, but after a while, I gave up. You know, even now today, I wanted to wear a jean green jacket, but I thought, you know, it might be a little bit too artificial. So, so it's always there, and uh, I, I cannot, uh, leave this topic without mentioning, uh, this is the classical seven sins of greenwashing. Uh, and this is by a Canadian environmental consulting company called Terra Choice. Uh, I think their seven sins were so famous that uh, even this company got bought over by UL, uh, Underwriting Laboratories, the very famous world safety certification company based in the US in Illinois. Uh, they, they actually bought over, but in, in short, what they mean is that they are, it, Greenwashing is manifested in many ways. It could be in certain so-called hidden trade-off. You know, you just put a paper and plastic, but no, nobody will know that actually even the comparison that you put up uh, are actually not so environmentally friendly, just like paper. Paper is actually not so friendly, particularly if you need to know the origin of the paper. Some of them may involve extensive logging, deforestation. So not all paper are born equal. Uh, they are false claim even from famous company 3M Scotch just made certain claims and nobody could verify and you know find out where the claims come from. Or feeding. Feeding the the, the simple meaning is just uh trivial lie, simple lies or even white lies. And and this is not only white light, it's very blatant lie by a Korean company. I think it received a lot of media attention in its free. They actually cover a plastic bottle in paper. Literally, I mean, and say, hello, I'm a paper bottle, but you tear open the paper, uh, it's so direct and it's actually a plastic. And of course, you know, uh, no proof, same as false claim, Energy Star is the uh, certification in the US by the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. And you know, or you make some trivia, lesser of no evils, just like fuel efficient sports utility car, but actually does not uh, you know, move away from the fact that they actually consume more liters. And of course, irrelevance, you can claim is CFC free, but nobody will know that actually the whole world has spent CFC since 1987, so it's actually an irrelevant claim because it's not feasible. Yeah, so so you know there are many scenes, and even right here in our hometown in Singapore, in our little city state, uh, the research that I have done together with my colleagues, uh, my research center has uh has been commissioned by our Singapore Exchange to do uh sustainability reporting assessment and review. Uh, for all the listed companies in our stock market here. So the, the latest version we have done was just last year. We are going to next, hopefully do the next installment is a biennial compliance study. And among many, many uh, things we have found among all the issuers in the stock market, among all the indicators and uh, if, you know, maybe not now, but later on, if you just go Google my research center, all the reports, presentations, and perspective are all uh, uh, available on the web. But there's just one particular, one particular finding uh, that I want to highlight, uh, which is this thing called disclosure on favorable aspects of the company and unfavorable aspects. And this is actually indicative of greenwashing, especially if the indicators are environmentally oriented. 100% of all the listed companies in Singapore consistently in our two biennial study 
display very proudly the favorable aspects of their achievement. Perhaps only about more than half or less than two thirds uh, show some unfavorable aspects which are material or significant. For example, workplace accidents, environmental degradation leading to fines or, you know, or, or other malpractices that are actually exposed by the media and you know, resolved in the courts, but they just don't you know, give the full disclosure. And of course, you know, this is very interesting and, and what we found as a secondary finding, if you look on the right, you know, uh, many of the claims, <laughs> you know, internally a, a shirt is already quite low, but if you look at external assurance for many of the sustainability, I'm not sure whether this is also indicative of the Indian markets. Only 2.8% of our listed companies, and when we say listed companies, the really the vanguard of the whole sector is not just, uh, you know, the mom and pop companies, you know, of all shapes and sizes, it's actually the lead horses, barely not more than 3% do external, you know, assurances and then if you look at india you know my my colleague uh yvonne actually did, did a web search and you know we, and of course we found some advertisement too and i think it's also quite prevalent uh, without claims and you know uh, and proof you know sometimes you, you put eyewear you say this is biodegradable but uh, we, we have no sense that this is something that is you know verifiable of course maybe it's true but at, at least from what we have found, we don't see the evidence. But of course, sometimes you know, uh, reputable institutions, of course, the government of Delhi, you know, uh, you know, you make a claim. But of course, uh, we can see that, uh, in in such claim, uh, is backed by, uh, I would say, a high level of uh, authority. So, so perhaps, uh, I think sometimes you know, when you make claim, uh, you have to write on your reputation a lot. So, you know. Yeah, so perhaps I would uh, do the clicking and let my colleague Yvonne uh, do the articulation. Yvonne, yeah? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, so um, we'll start from this slide? Or, yes, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, um, so uh, how... Okay, it's time to take a look at what consumers think about greenwashing. So, a survey by Nelson with consumers around the world revealed that more than 50% of participants are willing to pay more for sustainable products and services. And in another study, it was found that uh, consumers generally have a negative perception of a company once they learn that the company is engaged in selective disclosure. So uh, what, is select, what selective disclosure is, is that uh, when a company only talks about the positive environmental benefits without mentioning its negative environmental impacts. Yep. Uh, so um, in general, consumers with higher environmental knowledge tend to be more skeptical of companies green claims and are wary of companies that engage in greenwashing but um, some very smart companies they get around that but um, and, and still like manage to convince um, knowledgeable consumers that that they are not greenwashing by using um, nature imagery in their greenwashing ad so it gives consumers the impression that they are an environmentally friendly company Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, greenwashing is uh, truly a global problem, and uh, as we found in uh, an article that we wrote recently, uh, consumers in Singapore as well are success susceptible to greenwashing. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, moving on to um, understanding the psyche of consumers in India, um, and and the uh, how greenwashing is like in India. We, um, a study analyzed 276 green print ads and they found that um, a, a lot of the uh, ads were uh, shallow and moderate. So they, they made shallow and moderate claims, green claims. So what 
shallow claims are is that they are vague. They don't really, they, they might claim to be green. The product might claim to be green, but they don't really like give any substantiating evidence. Uh, as for moderate claims, they are better than shallow claims. Um, but they, what, however, they, they, they don't really go into much detail about why the product is green. So deep claims are the best because they address specific environmental issues. For example, detailed description of a film, um, new pollution prevention, prevention equipment. Yeah. Um, so, uh. Marketeers are also very, um, they, they, they know like how to win the consumers over. So they don't just, uh, use like words and imagery. They also make use of, um, celebrities. So, uh, one of the techniques that they have employed is using celebrities that have certain expertise and also, um, high in physical attractiveness. So, uh, these celebrities, um, they are able to like, uh, portray, a, a a product in such a way that make greenwashing claims appear more convincing. So consumers get fooled into thinking that, um, those claims ain't greenwashing. So, um, studies on, cons uh, con Indian consumers found that in general, um, the high income consumers as with consumers in other countries, uh, tend to have higher environmental consciousness and they also have a higher willingness to pay for green products. Those consumers also tend to be more knowledgeable about greenwashing and they are likelier to scrutinize products ingredients for signs of greenwashing. Okay. Move, moving on to, uh, the investor perspective. So, um. Greenwashing is also a huge problem in, in the financial world. So, uh, one of the things that have been affecting the financial world is like, um, ESG funds that they are actually greenwashing investors. So, um, like what has been found recently is that 85% of ESG funds were guilty of misleading marketing. So, uh, what's at, what is misleading marketing? So it means trumpeting ESG ratings and accolades while making token gestures towards operating sustainably or implementing ESG investment processes. So, uh, greenwashing tends to occur for ESG funds due to the increased demand for ESG products, which is unmet by the current supply lack of standardized ESG benchmark and demand from market consumers, which, um, and, and these motivates companies to focus on PR strategy instead of substantive, substantive actions to improve their environmental performance. Um, other than ESG funds, uh, green bonds are also a subject of greenwashing. So, uh, green, what green bonds are is that they're actually, um, bonds that are aimed at financial financing green projects, such as renewable energy investments and energy efficiency investments. Um, so, yeah, so recently a group of banks have banded together. I mean, uh, not, not that recent, like they banded together in 2014 to form the green bond principles, which is a set of voluntary guidelines that support disclosure and transparency to advocate integrity, integrity in the green bond market. Uh, yeah. So, uh, in Singapore as well, uh, we have, we face the usual, uh, challenges, uh, related to greenwashing in the finance sector. So, um, the monetary authority of Singapore recognizes the challenges of greenwashing in sustainable investing. And they are looking at ways to address it, such as coming up with a framework to help investors and investment firms, um, outline what are the do's and don'ts of sustainable investing. Okay. Um, in India, uh, green, like the popular popularity of green bonds 
uh, also means that uh, investors should be uh, wary of greenwashing. So, um, green bonds are really important in India in helping India meet its green energy and climate goals. Um, however, as uh, green bonds become increasingly popular, the Reserve Bank of India also acknowledged the challenges of greenwashing with green bonds as issues such as false claims of environmental compliance and plurality of uh, definitions have surfaced. Yeah, other than uh, green bonds, uh, as with many other countries that are uh, jumping on the bandwagon of uh, sustainable investing, ESG funds are also increasing, increasing in popularity in India as awareness about sustainable, sustainable investing increases. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yvonne, you want me to take over? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank the, you. Prof. The next part is very heavy lifting. So uh, <laughs> I, I I think I will take over yeah. this heavy lifting part. Regulation. Thank you, Prof. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Uh, you can see my research associate has done all the homework. Uh, you know, I think uh, she will get a bonus. But uh, let, let me now move on to, to see what has been done. You know, particularly, you know, you look at the both angles consumer as well as investor angles you know the, the, the two side of the equation in fact the two very primary stakeholders of a company and now this is the third part of the trilogy which is the regulator and why why is greenwashing so serious a matter is particularly because many companies many countries are now moving into the next era of sustainability which is actually to combat climate change trying to look at climate mitigation, climate change mitigation, climate change adaptation. And so, so I think this is even more important because if we continue our greenwashing, all our efforts in climate action will just go to naught. So, so for example, in Singapore, you know, my, myself, uh, you know, Yvonne and myself have been writing quite a lot of pieces uh, in our local space uh you know to to try to move the needle but so far you know it's been quite good you know even in the business time our business uh daily national daily even put into the editorial you know after a lot of uh, persuasion by my center uh, you know there, there's a lot of awareness going on um and not only uh in singapore if you look at what is happening in the two I would say signature markets, the UK and the US, uh, you know, the Treasury Department, which is basically the the, uh, the, the the finance part of the government, including even in the US, beyond just the financial part, even the Trade Commission, uh, which is also part of the government, uh, they, they have been getting into the game a bit only recently. You can see all the dates are 2021. So it's something very recent and I like, want to highlight certain things, which is also not only the you know, uh, signature markets like US, UK, even uh, in continental Europe, Netherlands has been uh, quite bold. Uh, they even find business if, you know, if they do misleading claim, they can find up to 1% of their gross turnover. I think this is something quite serious. You know, you, you, you know they, they have to put their money where their mouth is. And uh, in Australia to uh, you know uh, ESG investment have been claimed, but one of the most critical, uh, I would say, uh, development is actually in the UK, and I think it is it, it, something that many other countries can emulate. In fact, uh, even myself, uh, we you know we we have put out uh, some public document, you know, um, commentary that Singapore should also follow. You know the the uh you know to draft this consumer protection law uh to to protect consumers not only with all other claims about the products about the services you know i think many of you probably are aware uh in in at least in the singapore context many of the consumer uh i would say um, false claims are in construction renovation in travel in beauty care but now uh the uk is upping the you know uh anti on environmental claim and even right now uh it, it has already published the 
final version of the consumer protection guidance in the UK and I think it's already available uh, as a public document and of course Singapore too we are upping the game beyond just the existing instruments uh, which is the consumer protection act as well as the code of advertisement practice and I think I, I want to highlight that uh, man, many jurisdiction markets actually rely on their advertisement uh, I would say documentation in moving into green washing. I think it's very good. But of course, there are all other uh, legal instruments as well in Singapore. And as in most Commonwealth countries, we have uh, a misrepresentation act that can be activated. But in India, it's very, very interesting from what we have found. And I think in the discussion, perhaps members of the audience can elaborate and you know inform all of us if you happen to be working in this space you know the ASCI is I think the pinnacle body together with its constituent the CCC which is uh, technically the heart and soul of ASCI the consumer complaints council part of ASCI uh, they, they have you know uh, put up you know uh, various uh, guidelines uh, and of course but of course, the, the problem with ASCI, and I'm sure many of members of the audience know, is it's a voluntary self-regulatory organization, uh, HQ in uh, Mumbai. But again, it, it relies on the voluntary uh, behavior of companies and whether, whether this is satisfactory going forward to take greenwashing by the horns uh, is something perhaps uh, I'd like to hear your views as well in our discussion later. And of course, uh, moving into the game, and I think this is very good, savvy. I think uh, if members of the audience here are directors on listed companies, uh, I think you, you, you savvy is something on top of your mind that gives you sleepless night, <laughs> or you know most of the time. They, but and I think recently they issued some disclosure requirements, at least on green bonds. And just now my colleague Yvonne talked about green bonds. Green bond is one of the key. Uh, you know, part of uh, the green finance space that is advancing very, very fast. I think it's really the lead horse now among all the instruments of green finance, green bond. So SEBI has been very, very active. I think I like to commend SEBI. I think they are doing a very fantastic job. And of course, green bonds, uh, you need to be benchmarked against uh, global standards, uh, particularly if you are in, you know, I talk about paper just now, you know, you, uh, deforestation uh, was a very hot topic in COP26 last year, the uh, the conference of party, which is held in Glasgow uh, in uh, late last year, and talk about deforestation. So there was this German-based forest stewardship council that's very important. And of course, uh, the CBI, the Climate Bonds Initiative. But even beyond bond, I think uh, this is something I like to share my observation. Uh, this is something I think is very, very important development in India, SEBI. Uh, and I'm sure the audience will know very well uh, the BRSR and as an international observer, I like to, you know, uh, send my commendation uh, for this, you know, the, the uniqueness about this BRSR is that I think it's like no other instrument in the world. It's first of its kind because it stipulates a reporting format and there's an establishment of the links between financial results and ESG performance. So, so you know, um, myself at the research center in Singapore, we have been assessing companies in sustainability. The reports, the disclosure comes in all shapes and sizes, even in our market here, we don't require them to report in a certain standardized format. What SEBI has done in the BRSR is to actually stipulate two annexes. And then I am sure all the audience know it. I think you will probably have nightmares trying to fill in all the tables. But I think from uh, international observation, I think it's very good because it, it, it sets certain standards and you can actually benchmark and compare across companies, across industry, across peer very, very easily. So I think, uh, uh, this year is voluntary. I think from next year onwards, uh, it's going to be uh, mandate, uh, mandatory. I think it's very, very good development at SEBI. Okay, then let me move on to the last part of issues, which is 
uh, the emerging issue then I think there's something very much because carbon management, carbon credit, carbon offsetting, these are terms that directors are faced with not only in the Indian market, but all across the world, even in ASEAN, is something very, very new to most directors, actually. Uh, you know, the when, when, when I talk to directors, sometimes, you know, I, I speak of this word called decarbonization. Very, very interestingly, they most directors uh, could not, you know, keep up to date with this. You know, when, when I say you all should decarbonize, they look at me and say, oh, can I drink carbonated water? Should I ditch Coca Cola? You know, so so it's, it's the kind of I, I maybe it's done in humor, but it just shows that you know carbon management is something that is very very vulnerable to greenwashing. Uh, and of course, before we talk about the greenwashing part, that there's also a lot of accounting issues, double counting. For example, if you uh you know if you actually issue the offset uh at the at your home country, let's say in a country in Southeast Asia, say for example, Indonesia, if they sell a lot of credits because they have a lot of forests. You can count it against your own admission reduction. The buyer can also count it. So right now there's no accounting standards for credit as such. So I think there's something, you know, uh, I think many companies will have to tackle and buy, but I think the most important thing is, you know, it's very hard to track. And I think directors will face this problem uh, when they uh, urge their companies, you know, to do carbon offset. But uh, this is something not, you know, not done in many companies. First of all, we don't know who is responsible in the company. You know, when you say who them accountable, you the first person you haul up to your boardroom is the accountant. The accountant says, sorry. Uh, you know, uh, this is something green, but the only green thing I can deal with is the color of money, 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 money. Anything that is outside this scope of color of money, I could not help because they are not trained, which is rightly so. Even in my universities now, we train them in money, but not in carbon. And I think we need to actually uh, redress and revamp our curriculum for the business and the accounting professions very much because there's no standards, there's a lot of fuzziness, ambiguity, there's no verification as I talked about just now. And I think in the Indian context, I think it's something very interesting as well, particularly because, uh, you know, next to the two big countries, China and US, in India is also among the top three uh, emitter of greenhouse gases, even though, you know, the, uh, India also in itself, uh, you know, uh, acquires certain money by selling international credits in carbon but uh, again it's all left to the private sector and i believe many members of the audience might be involved in maybe selling and buying of carbon credits maybe we can take some questions later but it's not only just big companies like a steel company even smaller outfit in villages these are just one random example that my colleague uh, yvonne has picked up just just to show that it's not just always the big boys like the steel company, even villages in Andhra Pradesh, in Maya Pradesh, you know, um, many of these can, uh, you know, get involved in this whole carbon thing. But the question is, how do you verify? How do you actually make sure that it's true? How do you actually, when you buy a credit, it is not something that is falsely claimed? For example, you know, I just last year, I, I gave a talk to a company, instead of giving me a plug or you know some memento, I think it's very good. They, they just tell me that they are planting 100 trees in my name in Indonesia, and I really love the gesture. But up to now, I have not gone down to Indonesia to actually verify that 100 trees were actually planted in my name. But I, I really like the gesture. But yeah, so I think going forward, going forward, and I think this is, this is something where perhaps it might ignite and motivate, inspire members of this audience to share your opinion or even ask your questions. I think moving forward, it is very, very clear that, uh, you know, companies, you know, are actually sometimes doing greenwashing to the detriment of your two primary stakeholders, consumers, which will impact your revenue and investors which will be, you know, impact on your cost, which is, uh, you know, for example, the cost of capital. So how do you as directors, 
how do us as leaders of corporations ensure that the, our companies that we have oversight of are not doing the greenwashing because once you find out you were, you know, your reputation will go down. Uh, even the big case of DWS, you know, uh, you know, stock prices went down 13.7% in the day. So, you know, it, it might look small, but you know, so how, how do directors actually engage members of management to ensure that consumers and, you know, and investors are not taken for a ride. I think this is something that directors need to really sit down and foster, you know, a certain set of mechanism. And even uh, with that, that there's this issue of compliance, how do directors actually prepare for existing and more importantly, and I think very significantly, new regulations that might come out soon. And I think because it's such a big problem in sustainability, all the good work in sustainability is just being washed down the drain whenever people make false claim because you know this is to your advantage even not in companies even myself as a professor uh, I, I can see a certain trend in the resume the bios or cvs of my students i can see that you know these days they are putting green items even old items that are not so green they they make it green they make esg you know they they put you know this is called uh, I'll say resume greenwashing uh, is also happening in students, which I think is something that needs to be, you know, look at as well. Uh, yeah, and uh, of course, if you go to LinkedIn, I, the, the other day I was just looking randomly at LinkedIn CVs. I can see a trend now. Everybody is putting in all the alphabet soup, you know, ESG, uh, TCFD, GRI. Everybody seems to know everything about every standards in LinkedIn now, uh, except that, you know, we should put them to a test at the university. Yeah. And also another set of questions is net zero. And net zero is something, uh, uh, a target that many companies set. It's usually set very, very long from now. 2050, 2040, and in fact, even as soon as 2030. Uh, even for countries, they have set targets. Most countries set 2050. China sets 2060. I believe India set as 2070, which is good. I mean, you rather stay in Singapore. We have not set a definitive date. We, the government has only said we will do it after 2050 for net zero. And net zero means that your offsetting or whatever your reduction is in such a way that your carbon balance is zero. Uh, it, uh, in other words, uh, you might have uh, achieved carbon neutrality and of course carbon neutrality and net zero, there's some technical differences, but most people use it interchangeably. And last but not least, in this setting of IICA, I, I would venture to say, and I believe uh, the leaders of I, IICA will say that, you know, with all this landscape that Yvonne and myself have painted, uh, how do directors then develop capabilities, not only localized market capability, but globalized capabilities in sustainability, especially to understand climate change with strong sensitivity to greenwashing. And I believe uh, this is where I hope you know, IICA together with global or, or external organization collaborator like my university and research center can, you know, uh, I would say uh, enhance capacity building effort uh, among directors, especially the independent directors, because independent directors serve an even more objective and prominent role in organizations because of the fact that you are independent, you can see things without any color of bias in the companies because you are not the doer. So with that, I like to perhaps conclude this. Uh, sharing uh, myself and Yvonne together with uh, my other colleagues in the audience, Parity, my business development leader. Uh, we are very happy to share with you uh, seven sets of ideas, especially the last one, how do we go forward? And I hope uh, this will inspire all of us to uh, generate a discussion and Q&A for this next part with that. Uh, thank you very much and like to, uh, you know, pass the floor back to the organizer. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks, Professor Lo and Yvonne uh, for a very interesting talk. 
can we have questions, please, now? Let's open the platform for a discussion. And it's a great opportunity to interact with the professor and the team. We can have questions, please. Uh, I would request the members to please uh, use the option of uh, raising hand so that, you know, I can uh, send the request to unmute. Yeah, Mr. Anune. Uh, professor, it was a very, um, brilliant piece of uh, lecture which you gave us and it was very helpful what i would like to know is it not possible to have a change in lifestyle instead of just replacing one thing with another and then go on finding what is the environmental impact should you not have a lifestyle change for the individuals for the corporate bodies for our societies I would really like to know your opinion about this. Thank you, Professor. Yes, thank you, Mr. Anune. Yes, I, I think this is definitely a very, very powerful question. It all begins with the specific person, the individual. No amount of corporate, I'll say, exhortations will be effective if the individuals themselves don't start off with good habits. And I think that this is where education comes in, uh, you know, in at least what I'm familiar with, the Singapore schools, the universities have been inculcating uh, this strong sense of, first of all, is the awareness. Secondly, is the acceptance. And then third is the 3A, the adoption of good sustainability climate change practices that are not amenable to greenwashing. I think you are really right. We have to adopt this atomistic approach, which is down to the elemental individuals and i fully fully agree with you perhaps this would be the ultimate critical success factor yes thank you professor yeah thank you mr anune and um if the organizer i can see a lot of chat question as well you know i uh i yes. maybe i let the organizer pick the questions for me if possible to because uh so that sure, I can... sure. yes good evening can uh, yeah, can I... Ecology, yeah please come in uh, sure. And uh, uh, it was very interesting, Mr. Lawrence. Just uh, I had one, uh, you know, just for my understanding, but technology is touted as one of the, you know, biggest, uh, you know, uh, uh, no innovations uh, for the mankind, and so many things are happening there. I just want to know what are your thoughts on its contribution to global warming? Because I feel that it's quite a, you know, of a huge magnitude world over. And uh, I, as when you talk about greenwashing. Yes, I think every entity using a lot of technology uh, would be greenwashing, I feel. So I just want your thoughts on this. Yes, uh, thank, thank you, Ms. Shasikala. Yeah? Yeah. Yes, Shasikala. Yes, yes, yes. I think you're right. The, the role of technology in, in my mind, in fact, in many of the work I do at the research center, including many years ago when I was doing my PhD, I think the chairman said I was at MIT, you know, we, we used to see technology as you know as a double agent mechanism it cuts both ways and i think the 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 way we have expressed technology now at least in the world at least in the corporate sectors in all jurisdiction including singapore india you know the big country of india the small island of singapore uh, we we have actually not effectively and efficiently use it more so in the sustainability angle, and uh, I think that one of the key problem is actually energy consumption. We are still very, very dependent on fossil fuel. Uh, in you know, even in EV ele electric vehicles, I'm, I'm sure it's picking up as also in the market. At least in some of the big cities in Singapore, is you know, it's broadening on quite well in in the big market of China. In at least in some big cities, EV is coming up, but but I think that the problem in EV is, you know, you are actually just changing the scope of carbon emission from the so-called direct emission to indirect purchase energy. So it depends on the efficiency and the sustainability of your power grid. So this is the negative part. But the positive, I like to end with a positive spin. It cuts both ways, also in a favorable way, because I know of many, at least here, many fintechs, financial technology companies, 
they actually use technology to mitigate carbon emission, to do proper accounting, to solve many of the issues uh, that were actually eradicate or even uh, significantly reduce carbon emission. And I think uh, that while technology create a problem, I think technology is also the solution. So, you know, I hope it can solve itself and all of us will live happily ever after. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lawrence, and Yuan, it was an insightful perspective. My question is when we talk about corporate governance and role of director, and at the same time, we are talking about greenwashing. Are we talking about the fashion tag? The EAC has become a global fashion tag where the real issues are blanketed by green bonding or issuance of uh, certain carbon footprints. Whereas we can see the this decadence of like it's a degraded climate change where we see Amazon fire, where we see the Swiss Canal abruption and the oil perspective. So we we are having a different world where we are talking more on ESG and the global footprint on carbon, whereas we we are seeing a completely change environment which is not supporting humanity yes yes so, I, I think okay yes. yeah yes i think uh, mr uh, deepa agrawa uh, that that's a very very uh, astute observation you know that the role of the companies the directors and what uh, you know part should governance play in fact even in the esg equation a lot of people tell me that why you know in esg g is the third alphabet it's not even alphabetical. Is it an afterthought? Is it the last piece? Is E always the first and the S and the is forgotten? F. Yeah, so so I think uh, I, I would say that, you know, this governance and sustainability, the, the fundamental puzzle is which is the cart and which is the horse. And I would venture and I, in fact, I, I shared this uh, just uh, a few days ago in another speech that I made uh you know to another audience that you know governance is actually the horse sustainability is the car you need something to give sustainability the kick in the pants you know the nut the nut on the shoulder or you know the the wrist you know tap the wrist but something the leaders need to be very important which is why i think the ultimately it's the role of directors and I think we no need to actually reinvent the wheel. If you look at, say, corporate governance practices, say India, all the regulation and instruments are already there. All you need is to, you know, uh, obey them. For example, you look at very, the very comprehensive, uh, say, in India, the, you, you know, your company is actually very, very elaborate, you know, more than even uh, in Singapore, even in the UK, the, especially in the revision in 2013. And of course, I'm very, very impressed with, uh, say, your safety, uh, listed company uh, regulation. I'm sure all of you know, uh, I better not say you know better, Cross 49, you know, the, the comprehensive provision in Cross 49. You can actually activate all the existing buttons there to mitigate sustainability because ultimately it's about the due diligence and the role and responsibility of a good director. You no need to even plug in the lexicon into all your corporate governance documents. If you are a good director, you will know what to do because this is for the interest and the welfare of the company. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Professor Lo, uh, this is Ami here, and thank you for that uh, insightful uh, time. Uh, indeed, very helpful. Uh, my question was partly answered by you in your previous answer, but I so I wanted to actually uh, seek from you some input and I advise on, you know, what would be your um, top three advice to independent director uh, who are sitting on the board uh, from based on your experience and from what you have seen? I know that in India we are evolving and we are evolving towards the, the better uh, side of it. You know, our policies are changing. The framework is changing, undergoing change continuously. Uh, but if if you were to give a top three advices to independent director on how to make this, uh, you know, possible, um, what what would be your advice, sir? Uh, 
Okay, top three advice. Uh, let me just think off the cuff. I will say the three C. Uh, first, I think for all directors, because uh, there are just, you know, so many things about sustainability, about the, this new paradigm about climate change, particularly in including the users and abusers of climate change, which is basically greenwashing. I think first of all, I think as director, even myself, you know, uh, we, we need to build our capability, the new skill set. It, it will not just come to you know drop upon us like a helicopter you know implanting knowledge all of us have to invite these new skills in the very structured way uh, so capability development is number one number two i think directors because of your allocative responsibility in company uh, i would say capacity building in the corporate sense you need to line up the right capacity and resources so directors have to, you know, uh, you know, just like the horse again, you have to pull the cart, uh, make sure that resources are allocated in the right priority now, uh, not in the past where, you know, sometimes it's just for uh, monetary pecuniary gains, but now it's actually something that you can uh, do good while doing well. And I think, of course, the last C, I would say as director, I think, uh, especially in climate change and you know sustainability, we are always doing a lot of uh, lip service. So I think ultimately, I think back to one of the men, you know, uh, one of the discussion just now talk about individual uh, habits and what to do. I think the last thing is commitment. I think hopefully today, I think uh, my my colleague Yvonne and I has uh, at the very least sensitize this audience to some of the nuances of you know sustainability and greenwashing at least from an external perspective yeah okay 3c capability capacity commitment <laughs> uh, professor lawrence this is the ph ravi kumar uh, you know for a country like india uh, the global commitments made have to percolate down to the corporates individual corporates so at a macro level, one needs to identify the key em emitting sectors, which mm -hmm. are full ecology. What is the time frame for our gradual scale down of those emissions? What mm -hmm. are the alternative technologies because the companies cannot be shut down? Goals and targets to individual se emitting segments and then down to individual companies. Yeah. Social impact. When you do a migration like this, it is always the small and medium enterprises which suffer. Yep. Uh, and contribution from those countries, particularly developed countries, which have already harmed the environment and have reached a level of economic growth, they need to contribute because you can't now tell countries like China or India to uh, say you don't you stop anything that you have done what you have you can do in the past. And last is work with the government to evolve a roadmap to reach our commitments made at global levels. Now I'm yes. asking you, have you done this work for any one country? What yeah. are the challenges you have faced in arriving okay. at this roadmap? Okay, uh, very good question, Mr. Ravi Kumar. Thank you for the question. Let, let me share my personal perspective and so also based on many of my research. Uh, first of all, I, I have to say that in climate change, in uh, decarbonization in particular, it is infeasible. In fact, it's not practical, even rather said to impose immediate cold turkey. Cold turkey means you totally abstain from all carbon emission. It's totally unrealistic. Then the next thing is, you know, what is the time frame? And I would say, you know, many companies, especially in Scandinavia, uh, Western Europe, they are committing to 2030. In fact, the, the, the Paris Agreement uh, in itself have a 2030. Uh, Five zero time frame for preferably 1.5 degrees, not more than that in terms of global warming above the pre-industrial temperature. So, so I think the very important thing is to set a realistic time frame. I, I think that the problem now is a lot of people set time frame in a very interesting way because they, they, they just do it for the symbolism. In fact, everybody do a net zero now, primarily because of public image, you know, uh, the it's all done by the corporate communications department, not done by the CEO of sustainability because it's good public image. And 
the thing is, even if you put as early as 2030, a lot of CEOs, a lot of directors of Copcom will say, I, in eight years' time, uh, I'm no longer in the company, so I can just commit, you know, to, to this time frame. But, but I think we have to be rather state, and I think countries like India and China has been rather state. The pressure in the world is 2050, but China consciously at 10 years and I think India has added 20 years because you know you, you it's not just a PR exercise so that's this time frame then you mentioned about the next issue which is scope I think you are right we need to prioritize there are certain more critical sectors uh, the so-called in my research we call them high impact sector uh, in terms of uh, I would say carbon contribution so for example in construction in property in energy uh, production, you know, if you are talking about power plant, they, you know, we they actually emit more energy than even the whole village sometimes uh, for a long time. So, uh, you know, we, we need to actually move uh, in a very progressive way. It's not just, you know, you have a hammer that hits all sectors at once. And having said that, even the Singapore approach now, uh, Singapore has just uh, this year, just actually just last month in January, uh, started to require companies to report on climate change based on TCFD, the Task Force on Climate Related Disclosure. And I think, you know, uh, and we do it in a very progressive way. For this year, it's comply or explain for all companies. For next year, a certain subset of companies will have to go mandatory. And one, two years from now, another set is added in in the very, uh, say, calibrated way. So this thing about scope and time frame are the two issues you have to manage in any companies. Set realistic goals, make sure they are verified, go beyond the PR. The cold turkey is unrealistic. Go for the warm turkey. Warm turkey meaning that you, you warm their heart, give them the incentive, make it nice and palatable. Yeah, so use a warm turkey approach. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Ravi, yeah, Ravi Kumar. Yeah. So, Professor, uh, you, you have not answered my question whether you have done a study for any country in evolving the road. Oh, yeah. A study, if you look at specific countries, yes, I'm quite familiar. Not so because I, I live in, say, USA. Uh, I live in the state of Commonwealth of Massachusetts. They have. Uh, a decarbonization statewide strategy that goes all the way to 2050. So if uh, members of the audience, I would strongly encourage you to reference the Massachusetts decarbonization strategy. I mean, uh, maybe five minutes from now, all of you Google, you can download the whole report, I would say, in my hearts of heart, not because I lived there for eight years, but it's really a very good state level uh, decarbonization strategy that is very comprehensive, that's very stakeholder centric. So go for Massachusetts. In fact, just uh, California is catching up, but surprisingly, the whole US does not have a strategy. But anyway, US work by the states, not by the federal. So yeah. And in all other countries, uh, it's bits and pieces, not as much as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the USA. That's the example. I hope I answer your question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. Could I could I submit my question? Hello. Yes. Yes. Please, yes. please go uh, ahead, Professor. It was an interesting uh, presentation. I have just one question. Uh, let me formulate it in two ways for better clarity. You know, one is how does one prove greenwashing? Hmm. To ask the question in a different way, you know, how do we distinguish an allegation of greenwashing from the actual act of greenwashing? So, can can you give us some guidance on the points that we can look at, which would help us, you know, uh, mm. find evidence for greenwashing? Thank you. Yes, I think that's a very fantastic question, Mr. Jaya Sanka. Yeah, I, I do get that question very regularly, and I am very happy to get it even from a leader like a director. I think, first of all, you already have the keyword that the first place to look at is verification, assurance. And I think uh, at least in the study that I've done in the ASEAN and Singapore context, many companies take the effort to do external assurance on their sustainability performances. 
And it need not be the whole piece of sustainability. It can be piecemeal. For example, the environmental part of sustainability is where verification is most needed. The, uh, no, the amount of carbon emission, uh, the amount of waste that you generate, the amount of water that you consume. Uh, no, all, all these are very objective statistics that should be verified. And uh, the big four companies have their capabilities, including the German uh, you know, certification company, the TUVs, I think they, they, many of them can do that for you. But having said that, I think if you look at companies beyond just verification and assurance, I, I think the, my second point is to look at, you know, in specific things like certification. Uh, again, this is something very tangible buildings. In Singapore, we have the green building standards, uh, you know, uh, in certain uh, very big range of products in Singapore, we have the green labeling scheme. You know, uh, you go to the supermarket, sometimes they have the green label that is, you know, led by almost a quasi government type of council, Singapore Environmental Council. So you, you, you know, look at your points of interest, look for certification by objective external party, not by internal claims, not by a claim by 3M Scotch on your Scotch tape or something, but by something that's credible. Then the next point I like to do is, of course, uh, beyond all the specific greenwashing, I think uh, I think it relies on our good sense. You look at a company, uh, sometimes, you know, you no, no need to be a rocket scientist. You look at the way they, uh, you know, approach the sustainability question. I think, first of all, look at their narrative. You, you know, if I, you know, uh, a few years ago when I started to be a judge for, I, I think I'm a judge for sustainability reporting in almost all competition in Singapore and Asia. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, every time I look at a set of sustainable report, invariably the cover is always green in color. <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, I, I look at the narrative, look at the credibility, look, look at uh, the way they articulate the, you know, the setting, the story. And one important thing that I look at in all their uh, delivery in terms of the evidence is specificity. I, the favorite statement that I get from all the boards of director in our assessment is the board strongly believe in sustainability, you know, and, you know, and, and all the general statement talking about motherhood and apple pie, you know, and nothing specific. Then they have go down, you know, for example, in this financial year, uh, we know our carbon emission has gone down by uh, 73%, you know, uh, you know, a, a few specificity helps to, you know, lend credence to your genero in you know in, in singapore in many countries they call it motherhood statement <laughs> yeah go go beyond mm -hmm. the motherhood go 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 for the you know the i would say the um, i would say more concrete you know concretize what you say yeah so so i think that if, if these three approaches i think roughly you'll be there and of course the last one is to look at some of negative news uh is this company always in the news for the wrong reason you know uh, are their plastic bag, you know, uncovered by another lab company, not to biodegrade as they claim, you know, and they make worse than even conventional ordinary grocery bag, which is what happened in, you know, just now the example that I showed. So, so you know, it, it, it is something uh, you have to do it, but I think right now, as I said, you know, in the regulation part, the burden is on the consumer. I think it's not the right way. I think because of sustainability, like it or not, it's still a public good. I think the regulatory agency will have to take the lead now, particularly to jumpstart our preparation for, you know, a better informed populace, better informed consumer market. Yeah. Thank you. I know it's TGIF. Would you like to? Yeah. Hello. Yes. Um, may I ask a question? Um, sure, sure. See, the carbon credit trading concept has been there for close to 15 years or more. How successful has it been over the years across the world in actually, uh, you know, helping to bring down uh, carbon emissions? Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you, Ms. Basuda. Yeah, 
precisely because after 15 years we are still talking about it it means that we are still not there yet <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know if after 15 years we you know fundamentally there are many set of questions we have to we are still grappling with is offsetting the right mechanism how about carbon taxation as the alternative way uh, which is practiced in some jurisdiction including singapore we, from a regulatory uh, perspective our government has chosen the taxation path but it means that if you know you can pollute if you can afford it i mean that's the basic message of taxation but it's so easy to you know uh, i would say collect the revenue and you know do the accounting but then this offsetting i think the, the biggest thing in offsetting i would say greenwashing how do you make sure uh -huh. how do you verify that the piece of forest in a remote part of cambodia is actually something that is offsetting and then you are not on the ground to check i mean it's just a piece of paper i mean i have a piece of paper in front of me now that say i have 100 trees in indonesia if you want i can show uh -huh. it to you now yeah, I can actually show it to you now. This is the piece of paper that say I have 100 trees in Indonesia. <laughs> I cannot check them. <laughs> I'm so proud of it. I pin it on my board all the time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Shikant, would you like to come in? Please unmute yourself, sir. Shikant sir, please unmute yourself. The controls are at the bottom of the screen. Sir, controls are at the bottom of the screen. You would like to check, please. Now I'm going to the top. Hello. Oh, is is anyone talking? Yeah. Shikan uh, sir, uh, oh, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Now I can. I can. Yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, my question is: uh, many countries are claiming uh, uh, about this circular economy, and they are giving various percentages. Who are they validated, and are they uh, on the web? Uh, Who are they validated, and is it done by any independent agency, or what are those? Uh, what economy? Circular Sorry, economy. That... Oh, circular economy, yes. Circular uh, economy. This is, an... this is another favorite topic. <laughs> you know, it, it, circular economy technically means that uh, there's no net addition of waste to a particular setting. And right now, as in green setting, it's very, very hard to verify. In fact, uh, a lot of economies, companies are always just dancing around the tree. I, I would say sometimes we are just chasing our tail in circular economy. Uh, pre precisely because, you know, again, it's a very good claim. But then who verify your waste generation? Who verify that whatever you, you know, pollute or exude is actually captured and put back to the company because in the pure circular economy, which is something a dream, not a reality, you know, there's no net addition to our ecosystem in terms of uh, artificial product. It is infeasible. So, so I think that this thing about circular economy, you know, uh, may not make sense to many companies, but let's be very realistic about it. I mean, a certain amount of waste is actually necessary i mean that's human biology too or or, or even you know live all living things at zoo waste is is a fact of life yeah so i think we, we just need to find a good way to make sure that our waste are minimized number two it can be trans you know transformed into uh i'll say forms uh or ways in which mm. it does not pollute the environment so it is not a complete eradication it is just uh, hopefully purposeful minimization and i think if we even can reach that we have won the better yeah okay thank you yes yeah thank you mr khan yeah i think uh, so i i don't see any more questions now um 
Yes. Uh, uh, is there any uh, one question? We can accommodate one more. Uh, I think Aruna ji wants to ask something. Please go ahead, Aruna ji. Unmute yourself and please go ahead. We can't hear you, ma'am. Can okay. you please unmute yourself? I did. I did, sir. Great. Thank you so, yeah. Thank you so much, Professor, for your wonderful insight into greenwashing. I have a small question. See, now when we are using petrol or diesel vehicles, the emissions are only into the atmosphere and they diffuse into the atmosphere. So the toxins they are released are less harmful. Now, when it comes to EV, the batteries over a period of time need to be dumped underground. So this will not only pollute the soil, but slowly it seeps into the water bodies. The challenge and the pollution are much more and more harmful or toxic compared to the emissions in the air of petrol or diesel vehicles. What is your opinion? Do you think we jumped the gun too early on this issue? I just want your insight into that, Professor. Yes, yes. I think, uh, Miss Aruna, you hit it on the nail. The battery in electric vehicle is the best kept secret now. Everybody is just talking about the petrol, the, the gasoline, you know, uh, in, in the US, we call it gas. In, in, in most of Asia, we call it petrol. We are so obsessed about the fossil fuel and the lithium based battery. Lithium in itself is the most environmentally uh, toxic material. And I think the current rates of uh, research and advancement in battery engineering and research has not caught up a lot. So we are still left with this last piece in, in the sense that, you know, uh, it is not, it might even on the net level put us back. We take one step forward. We might take two steps back because of the battery. And I think the battery technology has not really caught up. And, you know, it's not only in EVs. I mean, now, you know, I, I used to give a lot of thoughts, uh, even physically now that the events are all coming up popping out in real time. You, you know, uh, if you look at my bookshelf behind me, I have a lot of reusable wa uh, water bottles, metal water bottle, plastic water bottle, because they say we don't give you plastic water in a conference. So I actually collected like 20, 30, you know, uh, water bottle that actually have a carbon footprint, you know, uh, the next time I go, I won't take a metal straw because it will the, the break even for plastic straw to a metal straw is actually quite humongous. So, so, you know, I think we have to be quite wise in the way we look at sustainability, you know, and we cannot be so carried away that we actually ignore the bigger issue and the problem that underlies our optical part of sustainability, which is the EV. And the best kept secret is actually beneath the bonnet. And I think this is actually the killer. Yeah. And you're yeah, absolutely right, Miss Aruna. Congratulations. You call it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sir. Actually, I'm a chemical engineer by profession and I've worked on fuel cells. So that's the reason why I have some insight into the lithium batteries, you know. So yes. once the soil, like there is no bioremediation, there's a bioremediation for oil seepage in the soil, but there's no bioremediation for lithium into the soil and it slowly seeps into the water bodies. That's a very, very big concern. I'm really a little surprised why people are not still addressing or that should have been the research factor before introducing EV vehicles on road. Yes. I mean, and thank you so much for endorsing my views, Professor. I think. Yeah. I should... And I think the, the last point I made, Aruna, is in sustainability, in circular economy, in greenwashing, we need a life cycle concept. Not so much a one-off concept, which is what is, you know, look, uh, you know, uh, at the minds of policy makers, corporate decision maker. If we do a long-term life cycle analysis of all the components and all your products, I think uh, a lot of things will change in the way we make decisions about our consumption and our investment. Yep. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And I think I should thank, thank ISEA for the, I think it's one of the best lectures and insights that both uh, Professor Lawrence and his colleague have given are excellent. And I can't thank anyone better than this. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Thank yes. you so much.
so, uh, my friends, we are coming to the close of uh, the, this session. We have almost exceeded 20 minutes than the scheduled time. Uh, uh, and I don't see any more questions over the screen. Uh, dear friends, I would like to thank you for joining us, staying with us, and I could check. Uh, we uh, exceeded uh, uh, beyond 200 uh, at a point in time. And thank you, uh, Professor Lawrence Lowe and Yvonne specifically, and the entire team, Verity and, and others who uh, have joined us during this discussion. The discussion was uh, quite uh, relevant and have a long-term impact on future because uh, well, learning from the takeaways of this will uh, really give us an opportunity to sit back and think on the issues we have discussed and the way forward as well, specifically the pointers which have been raised in terms of the newer concerns on, on, uh, on uh, uh, you know, uh, EV vehicles or the concerns on battery. Of course, uh, I hope uh, more research will get into this and uh, we would try to make all possible efforts in making the world greener. Uh, uh, making the world more sustainable, making the corporations more sustainable. So I thank you all and wish you a very good evening and also would like to thank my colleague Amar who uh, uh, who had been instrumental in uh, putting us together and, and uh, convening this event in a very successful manner. Uh, uh, look out for our next announcement uh, 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 for the event on uh, Amar. It is on uh, 11th, I believe, right? So uh, we yes. will be having uh, Professor Afra Afrash, uh, Afrari, Af Afshari Poor uh, from US and would be uh, sharing her discourse on on uh, uh, her experience on corporate governance practices, specifically in India, and uh, comparing it with uh, 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 you know the exper experiences and experiments. Uh, in various other jurisdictions. So thank you all. Thank you, Professor and the team for joining us and sparing your valuable time. Let's look forward for taking our discussions forward uh, over the mail and, and during our next meeting. So uh, have a great evening. Uh, thank you very much once again. Okay, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank yes. You. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor Lo. Thank you on behalf of my colleague Yvonne and myself and Verity. Thank you, yeah, thank you, bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone.